So there'll be a kind of Q&A kind of thing afterwards. Mm -hmm. The video essay itself is an hour long because actually I made it for during a residency in 2016 for a radio broadcast on a um, like art radio station called Resonance FM um, for the residency. And so that's why it's, it's like literally an hour long because that was the um, hour long slot that I was doing it for. But I kind of wanted to do it also as a video because um, to look at the video essay as a, as a kind of medium. Like most of my work is actually to do with, you know, CGI and virtual worlds and a lot of computer graphics. So it was the first time I used um, found footage to put everything together. And I made it while researching one of the films that Henry mentioned, a, a CGI film called Geomancer, which is set in Singapore in 2065. And basically when I was uh, researching the context of the film, uh, geopolitical context about how uh, AI and automation are portrayed. It kind of, uh, in, in, in Asia as well as in kind of um, Western Europe and North America basically, I noticed like really strong parallels between the portrayals of AI and the portrayals of Chinese industrialization. Um, so that's why I made the video essay. I mean essentially to kind of to fill a void because it didn't exist. Like whereas um, there was a lot on, you know, futurism, Afrofuturism and Gulf futurism, as well as about science fiction in terms of uh, techno orientalism. There was nothing that kind of like dealt with the issue in a slightly more, I guess, playful or, you know, playful way. So it's a kind of video essay that's not meant to be didactic, but it's more kind of conspiracy theory because of course, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's like InfoWars or Fox News talking about the subject, or kind of, um, you know, BBC documentary about the subject, everything is really ideological. So I used, I think, I, I don't know how many different video clips to create this collage-like of imp uh, impression kind of divided into seven chapters, which I saw as the kind of key themes that characterize the sign of futurism, which were, you know, copying, computing, labor, gambling, addiction, um, and, and so on, because those were the two links between what I saw as the kind of, I guess, um, so, you know, Chinese culture that I grew up with as well, but they could be mapped onto uh, certain ways of talking about the future. So, um, and also a brief note, like the, the years 1839 and 2046, is, I also wasn't trying to say that there's one uh, overarching sign of futurism, like I'm quite overt about the fact that it's a conspiracy theory, so you either like accept it, reject it, or question it. But um, 1839 is the year of the um, first opium war, um, which to some, you know, obviously like kickstarted a certain kind of um, pseudo colonization or economic, uh, let's say, integration between, um, let's say, Western powers and, and mainland China that kind of still obviously plays out today in the geopolitics of uh, Chinese colonialism in relation and, you know, what's going on in Hong Kong or Taiwan, uh, as well as in Western North China quite a lot. Um, so it really feeds into today as in this historical imagination from 1839 and one of the chapters about addiction, obviously relating to uh, opium war, um, deals with that. And 2046 also refers to Wong Kar Wai's film 2046, but that year is, you know, the 50, the 50 years after the um, British handover back to China of um, Hong, uh, rule of Hong Kong, basically. So in a way, the specter is, you know, the kind of the way that the present is overshadowed by the past, as well as it's actually overshadowed by the future as well, which kind of creates a very strange temporal condition of li living simultaneously in the past and the future, which is, at least in my reading, slightly different to other notions of futurity or futurism that, you know, either start from, you know, a modernity going straight forward or other types of, let's say, Afrofuturism that are very much about um, a specific kind of time travel to, like, redress the past. So this was kind of my, um, a, a few things that were going through my head when putting it together. Uh, so I'll... Play it now and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, and yeah, please uh, set text through any uh, questions. And I'm just going to, um, as Henry mentioned, I'll do it through um, uh, the Zoom screen share. But 
yeah, if the audio is rubbish, you can look at the Vimeo link. And I think we'll reconvene in like an hour to, yeah, have questions and hate mail and stuff. Okay, let's see. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Oh, no, thanks. For, well, thanks for sticking Thank around or watching. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you um, would like to uh, perhaps um, uh, talk a little bit uh, about your uh, other works kind of in relation to uh, this film uh, specifically and how that has been sort of part of um, your investigation is the, into this in, entire idea of uh, sign of futurism. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I think, like I said at the beginning, so it was mm, kind of done nearly by accident when I was researching AI in kind of Singapore and East Asia. Um, the film which I was writing at the time, Geomancer, was done in 2017, so about three years ago now. And it was about basically a satellite AI who kind of awakens and, and comes down to Singapore in 2065. So, um, I mean, I was gonna show some trailers, but it's all online. So I think I'll just, I'll just talk about it now, basically, since we just watched for an hour. Um, so what I'm interested in is, I guess like that, one of the things is the boundary between fiction and reality in a sense. So in 2065, the, in the year 2065, part of the idea was that by that time, the AIs would have seen my video essay from you know nearly 50 years before that. So in a way, like kind of like how um, I suppose like art history also affects reality. Um, I was interested in integrating the the video essay into the film. So in that, the AIs actually kind of integrate. Um, actually use it as a as a kind of um inspiration for their kind of movement you know something that kind of like speaks to them in a sense um actually maybe i'll just briefly play the um trailer trailer for that because it kind of gives an idea of um of the other kind of parts of my work really which is more to do like i said with uh cgi and and so on rather than sign of futurism which was a video essay and was kind of relatively um, uh, unusual in that case. So I'm just gonna share the trailer from Geomancer now, which kind of gives an idea of what usually happens in, in my work, which is more about fiction rather than um, a kind of documentary, I guess, even though, yeah, Sign of Futurism definitely isn't a kind of documentary either. Um, so this is just a trailer and I'll kind of continue maybe talking about how it's um, displayed and how the ideas come across as well. 你知道看到每一波浪每一只鸟每一个动物和水面上反射着碎成意外拼的阳光是什么样的吗要看穿水直到鲸鱼都不敢游泳的深度而且不仅仅是看还要记住一切把每个细节着刻成神经网络我会是雕塑家。如果我有声音，我会歌唱；如果我有灵魂，我会祈祷。但是我只有心灵的眼睛，所以我梦想世界。So in in geomancer, basically, um, it kind of starts on. Uh, it starts in, in space, essentially, and then the satellite kind of comes down to Singapore, witnesses, and kind of like learns about its own future. So in terms of like a kind of narrative, it operates kind of like a coming of age story. 
which is, you know, pretty um, uh, common archetype in this kind of um, in, in this kind of film. But within that, it kind of weaves in the kind of geopolitical ideas as well as the future history of this video essay, Sign of Futurism. So that's kind of uh, continued to inform different projects I've done, which kind of includes video games and um, other films. And within this as well is also me thinking about the role of authorship, you know, not just about appropriation or collage, but also what, um, you know, how you can think about the afterlife of your own work. So in, in this sense, because it's, um, it's, you know, sign of futurism is kind of like a metafiction, um, but I also thought of how to comment on the way different, uh, I guess, different cultural movements have an afterlife beyond what they're originally intended as. So sign of futurism gets discovered by, a, you know, a group of AIs who um, identifies with it, but in a way that is a bit more, um, how should I say, um, uh, in a bit more a political way or a kind of, a, let's say, see it as a pro-AI stance, uh, essentially, and kind of appropriate it in, in that respect. Um, and so, you know, the way I was thinking about things as well is um, in Sinofuturism, it's about, you know, this kind of temporality that I was talking about before and how it works in, in the reason I geomats were set in Singapore is that it's not just um, a kind of post-colonial uh, geo geopolitical situation that it exists in, as well as a kind of modernist um, kind of development. But I also chose it that way because I'm, you know, really familiar with the place. And, and also it's somewhere that the landscape or the geography, the place really, uh, I guess, embodies these different time frames. So the Marina Bay where it's set is, you know, half, used to be on the seafront and now it's half reclaimed land. Um, uh, it's, it's mostly, you know, enclosed by reclaimed land that forms this, this kind of bay. Um, so it's also, you know, it's artificial as much as natural. And that's kind of what the idea was with um, uh, just the setting of the film, basically. Uh, whereas in Sign of Futurism, to me, I was kind of, uh, also thinking about, you know, where could, where could China be said to exist at the moment? You know, it's not, um, of course, in terms of a nation state, it's a geographic location. It's a, it's a kind of cultural place, history, uh, diasporic community, as well as the whole um, nature of, uh, you know, uh, a kind of um, the idea of a movement that's not actually culturally specific or it's not necessarily to do with identity, but is about the entanglement between uh, East and West, which is impossible to um, impossible to really have a very s simple explanation of the relationship between both those things. So yeah, that's uh, how it feeds into the rest of my work. I see, I see. Um, thank you. And um, so uh, speaking of which, I was kind of um, curious about how uh, perhaps uh, during the process, how, how did you identify and sort of um, delve into the, the, the seven of uh, the key stereotypes of Chinese society as you proposed, um, uh, computing, copying, gaming, studying, uh, addiction, um, labor, and uh, gambling. I'm just curious about the, a series of these like ideas, how that was kind of uh, woven into this kind of more uh, generalized, let's say, uh, narratives uh, that really latched on um, this um, idea of Sinosphere. Yeah, so I mean, they're very, I mean, it's very kind of intuitive, basically. So, um, it's not really like a kind of a scientific process. So, I mean, I really thought of my own personal experience as well as things that related to just technology that I could think of from, you know, growing up in a certain, um, at a certain time, basically. Obviously there were things that I saw the relationship between Chinese industrialized labor, as well as um, uh, things that are relevant to machine learning and AI, basically. So they were kind of chosen in that sense. And I guess compositionally, I wanted to think of a way that would, um, I guess, divide divide the, the video in a way that 
made it seem like it made sense, even though these things were um, essentially quite intuitively um, chosen. Um, but they were still obviously very relevant to both um, studies of research into deep learning. So for example, uh, AI re research with the paradigm of um, deep learning and neural networks uses a lot of um, game development as training simulation um, to, uh, to train the, the algorithms essentially. So um, I was just reminded, because I haven't actually watched the video essay for a long time, that at the end, the Go scene, so basically this was a 2016 match between AlphaGo, which is a Go playing AI developed by a Google subsidiary called DeepMind, which is based in the UK. And the, um, the founder of DeepMind, I think it's uh, Demis Hassabis, um, was actually commenting on how AlphaGo played during uh, the, the game that we saw in the final chapter. And so it kind of reminded me that essentially like, just like they say that Go and I guess chess and a lot of games are essentially, um, it's kind of like not, re it's kind of like the gamification of war, essentially, you know, chess is a war game, Go is a war game, um, that the, the way that simulation is instrumentalized pervades so many different things. And so whether it's the kind of uh, internet, uh, internet gaming addicted Chinese teenagers who go to, you know, like a, like a military boot camp essentially in order to get it out of them, it's very strange for me to see how the idea of like discipline or d essentially um, dehumanization is applied to uh, individual lives. And this wasn't something that was the only focus I was thinking of, but it's essentially how, uh, you know, and, and it really reminded me seeing these, you know, teenagers basically get disciplined in a very, um, in a very strict manner. It made me kind of, think about essentially how Alan Turing described um, AI in his, in his papers, which is, you know, it is a mistake to think of the future AI or intelligent computer as a fully formed uh, individual with judgment. It's more like a child, right? It's a child who is trained. And it's kind of amazing that, I mean, he, even in his, the first paper that he wrote that essentially invented the field of AI in 1950, in which he describes, you know, what's known as the Turing test today, really actually includes considering the AI as, um, as a, a child that learns as opposed to, um, as opposed to some kind of uh, more mature consciousness or force, essentially. So, I don't know, it's just, for me, re-watching it, I was also, I was not just thinking about whatever critical theory or historical things I've learned growing up, but it's how subtle the ways in which you are forced to learn things or you want to learn things are before you're a certain age of self-consciousness. And also Geomancer, the, the film Geomancer that came just after Sign of Futurism was about this, this idea of awakening of consciousness. So in relation to whatever, like history of the Opium War, colonialism or internal colonization in China, um, how once you gain knowledge, what do you do with that afterwards? You know, how do you redress it? It's a very important question. I mean, always and especially today. Thank you. Um, I was when I was watching the film, I was uh, thinking about um, uh, techno oriental orientalism and how um, I was trying to. Um, I guess in a way, in a sense, I was thinking about the perhaps uh, in the film. There's this. Um, or, or in this kind of um, uh, entire narrative about, um, uh, let's say, uh, contemporary Chinese um, uh, culture or, or uh, and its diasporic uh, uh, variations. I was thinking about this kind of, uh, let's say, um, perhaps general, uh, generalization of uh, individualities and, and um, uh, identity. Um, in a way, because uh, it's um, People's Republic of China is always uh, portrayed as um, you know this massive machine that kind of has all these um, uh, individual well consists of like 
a large group of individuals, but also um, uh, kind of work as, in a way, like, like a factory and then producing all of these um, ideas, products, and as like manufacturers. Um, and um, sorry, just touching on quite a lot of different things here, but also thinking about perhaps um, uh, in, in, in China, this uh, kind of uh, disruption of, um, uh, let's say, entrance into modernity, let's say, if you will, uh, um, during the, um, uh, when, when the Cultural Revolution happened. And then after that, how China opened up its uh, door to the world and um, how everything sort of started from the scratch, basically. And then there's always this kind of uh, tendency and like, let's say, push to achieve uh, economic success and then how perhaps by uh, copying or um, this kind of, um, uh, um, I was gonna say replicating, but also this idea is to like, uh, to interpret itself into this more globalized environment. So uh, I was wondering if you could, uh, any thoughts? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that. lots of thoughts. I mean, it's a huge subject, of course. Um, I think on, on one hand, I think firstly, the idea, you know, what do you do with, uh, what do you do with histories you've inherited, right? So I guess the one notion of uh, a kind of, or, or not just how do you do uh, what do you do with what you've inherited? What do you do with new knowledge that you gained, right? And also what do you do about, um, about what model of struggle against injustice is, is, is appropriate for a certain situation? So I think, I thought being, it's very complicated because of course, you know, simultaneously I'm sp speaking from my point of view on behalf of a future consciousness, but of course it's a kind of um, metaphor or analogy to uh, the representation of a generic nameless faceless mass, right? So basically what do you do with that situation? One tactic would be to say, no, we're not a nameless faceless mass. Me, you know, we are a collection of um, heterogeneous individuals with our own personality, our own, you know, our own identity and our own unique situation. I think the other tactic, I think, is to actually identify with a nameless, faceless mass. Because the, the paradoxical thing is, if you say, no, we're not um, anonymous, we're actually individuals, is that is the same, uh, that is essentially the dominant narrative that's being imposed, and therefore one becomes... Uh, you're using the standards of the oppressor to judge yourself, essentially. So it becomes a very tricky thing. And so I thought a way of thinking about it was actually um, identifying with the anonymity or the collective. And so in Geomancer, for example, it's about this idea of um, anonymity, actually, that's more important than individuality. So one observation, for example, that was maybe very obvious to me, but quite illuminating is, I think when I was in China for a show in 2017, some of my friends were explaining to me that, I mean, left is right and right is left, essentially. So in a state, in a place where socialism is the dominant authority, being left wing means being right wing, essentially, or like being pro-capitalism is the, is the equivalent of being counter dominant, which is obviously, you know, just black is white and white is black. Um, and I was thinking about that quite a lot in the sense that let's say in a kind of Western humanist model where individuality and rational rationalism is the, the model or the pinnacle or, you know, democratic pinnacle of um, the, uh, the linear, the progress of history, like, at the same time, what we get and we see now is that the fantasy, the latent fantasy that comes is this notion of solidarity, right? We're not atomized individuals. We're actually, you know, we should seek solidarity um, through kind of collective self-organized practice. If you flip that and you come from, or you imagine that you're part of a anonymous collective in the first place, then the latent fantasy would be to seek individuality. So this, the tension between how 
identity and collectivity plays out in 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 Asia for sure, and in even in you know UK where I'm based versus um, in Canada and the US is so so different because they all come with such different histories of diaspora displacement colonialism what indigenous means and and so on um that i could only really speak from just my my experience but um it it seems and it's also been really interesting um seeing how other people react to the video essay because again I think on a top line basis, people equate Sinofuturism with techno orientalism, which I mean, I think should be clear. It's like not what I'm saying at all, but also techno orientalism. It's also something that's very ingrained into the, um, into the media histories of, uh, media histories of, um, I guess, in, in my opinion, North American media culture, right? Because of the history of, you know, whitewashing different specific policies in, in Canada and then in the United States to do with um, East Asian immigration, which is different from the case of, um, in the case of, let's say, my kind of family history, which is more to do with British colonialism, which is slightly different and also is talked about in a, in a, in a quite different way. Um, but I've just noticed, yeah, very specific regional differences in understanding, I guess. Thank you. Um, so before I open up uh, the uh, Q&A to everyone um, for us today, I, I also have uh, just another question uh, because in um, a previous um, conversation um, between you and I and also Matthew, Matthew and you mentioned that uh, the work uh, sort of plays with these, um, with the archetype of uh, the conspiracy theory and um, you know, uh, where the theory could be uh, uh, sort of like walking a line between like truth and uh, fiction. So I was wondering if you can uh, uh, perhaps how you see uh, the viewer sort of process that visual data and how these messages are kind of intertwined with each other. Um, how, how, how did you envision that? Um, I guess similarly, it was fairly intuitive, but now for me watching it over again, I guess, um, the, I guess I'm, I'm interested in, you know, the kind of fiction versus documentary form and if it comes to films, um, I think with the, you know, conspiracy theory, like, I think one of Matthew's questions was, you know, what word of the year in 2016, I don't know how they choose this, these things was post-truth, um, this idea of like a post-truth landscape, what happens what happens in the midst of that um, were kind of like thoughts going through my head, but also how it relates to, you know, artificial intelligence, algorithmic bias and, and human bias. It's really uh, deeply intertwined with each other. I was looking, uh, one of my kind of favorite theorists before was, you know, Frederick Jameson, because, you know, I used to study architecture and he wrote really compellingly about, I guess, the latent symbolism in, in, in architecture, but also in many different um, popular media formats uh, in, in, in postmodern kind of way of thinking. And his way of, his conspiracy about conspiracy theories is essentially a loss of trust in grand narratives, um, a loss of trust in the government that, you know, comes with, in, in America, let's say, comes with like, uh, Korean War, Vietnam War, um, mediatized war, and the Watergate scandal. So his argument is essentially that when you can no longer trust the institutions who you believe you trust, you come to um, seek out a different map, cognitive map of uh, underlying reality, even though the map doesn't necessarily, cannot possibly account for the complexity of truth production. And the conspiracy theory, which often happens in audiovisual form, whether it's a kind of like Holly, Hollywood film, like the Parallax View or All the President's Men or something, um, or in a video essay format, like whatever, like Adam Curtis, or even uh, different forms of fiction, because there's, the conspiracy theory operates in a linear line that draws points of connection through the, the cognitive map. 
And so the social reason for it, I guess, is that it gives us comfort. It gives the confused citizen comfort because you think that actually there's linear cause and effect between, you know, like the president was corrupt, therefore this happened. Like, or the Vietnam War was lost or the war on drugs was lost or whatever you want to call it or systematic racism happens because of a linear process. Of course, the world is more complex than that. But I was using this, I was thinking about this with the, the video essay, right? Because of course, I could select whatever arbitrary footage I would find to say things that like, the opium war is wrong or like people are biased for or against China and so on. You know, I could construct more or less any argument because the way I constructed the film was also, I literally Googled, didn't even just Google, I YouTube searched China technology, China AI, and 50% were for it, 50% were against it. So that's how I got both um, Alex Jones info wars. They can't even make bullets in America to, um, to, you know, documentaries about internet addiction and, you know, like iPhone videos of people's Bitcoin mining farms. So the, um, even though the, the video essay was structured according to this chapters and this metafiction and conspiracy theory, the footage, like 80% of the footage that actually went into it was just as biased as the search was. Of course, I would have got a different set of source videos if I searched on Trudeau or Yuku or Chinese video services, like very different uh, source, but I used YouTube because to me that was a representative sample of um, impressions of, uh, of the, uh, of the um, topic. Thank you. Um... Does anyone have any uh, questions? Uh, feel free to uh, send in in the, the chat. Um, and, um, and in terms of these, uh, in terms of let's say the, uh, the musical elements of the work, I was wondering um, how, because you're also a musician and composer yourself and uh, how did you uh, sort of, uh, let's say um, in a way, um, let the, the, the musical elements sort of um, help with uh, the messages and also how, how did you kind of navigate uh, that? Because it's a massive, it's, um, um, it's a gigantic bank of um, uh, not only images, uh, visuals, but also sounds uh, as well. And then the sounds, some of them are quite uh, familiar. I would say, um, I believe I heard uh, like Moon River, right? Um, the remix version, all the, also, and then mm. perhaps um, even like dialogues from, um, I don't know, is it like TVB show dramas or, mm -hmm. um, so anyway, so there's a, a, a big variety of uh, sounds kind of in the work. Uh, could you, uh, once wondering if you could uh, talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, again, usually I kind of do soundtracks for my own stuff, like the stuff that's kind of, I do from scratch, um, but, you know, like to me, because the the subject is a huge collage of kind of conflicting views that may or may not quite mix. So I was thinking of really having like um, the texture to the soundtrack reflect that really. So either sometimes it contrasts, I mean, you know, in normal film editing, you know, either the soundtrack like um, complements or contrasts with what's being seen. Um, the the overall mood is meant to create some kind of uncanny weirdness, which is, you know, fundamentally what I felt about the subject anyway. Um, but a few of the things were, I guess, a lot of just video game soundtracks, especially ambient ones. Um, some stuff from like manga, like Neon Genesis, Evangelion, um, the soundtrack for that, but not the kind of most commonly known stuff. Um, but Essentially, I chose stuff that isn't super well known, but it might be weird enough to kind of trigger a different memory. So I think the the track Henry that you mentioned was um it's like a, a instrumental version of "Fly Me to the Moon," right? And um, 
I guess I was just choosing things for intuitively. It starts off with um, the first track that's heard is the soundtrack to a video game called Metroid Prime. Metroid Prime is uh, set, basically you're like some kind of space exploring soldier. And it's a very old game from, I think, you know, Nintendo from the 1980s and maybe even before that. But what's interesting is that the whole, um, the whole atmosphere of the game is deeply like moody and unsettling. It basically takes place in subterranean tunnels and I'm sure it's some kind of like whatever metaphor for like subconscious mind and so on. Um, but it was meant to like evoke some kind of deeper memory, which is kind of what I was like looking at um, when I was writing and, and kind of putting the, the video together. And it varies to different things. So in the, se in the section on copying or computing where there's a lot of um, like CGI rendered footage of, um, uh, CGI rendered footage of like architecture and like luxury apartments and houses, actually the, um, the CGI post-production house that made that uses uh, Hans Zimmer. So Hans Zimmer, famous Hollywood soundtrack um, uh, composer, is incredibly popular for you know soundtracking this epic stuff because he makes epic soundtracks, and so that was actually I think like the theme from Gladiator that you know there's this like operatic voice, who's a singer uh, Lisa Gerard, um, and it's just sometimes it reinforces the fake syntheticness of what's there but it's also hard to distinguish between you know with emotion I guess what is real and what is fake so of course in my other other work that's a big part of it you know like affect and emotion and it's interesting I really wanted to get that across like so it's not it's not an academic essay it really is like you know there it is about um, it is about feeling as well and emotion and you know you have kids crying people who want to like do well in their exams like people concerned about their future people talking about the fear of like loss um, or their childhood and so on so actually it was quite unexpected to me that it ended up being quite at least for me quite emotional because you know it's about people's stories of lived experience and it, it didn't end up being something about um, a kind of empty idea about, you know, technological critique that just didn't end up very important to me at the end. Thanks. Um, we have a question that was sent previously through email by Gabriel. Um, uh, Gabriel was wondering um, if um, uh, perhaps we could talk a little bit about the inspirations and um, um, uh, you were inspired by other artists and, uh, and some influences for the for the project. Yeah, I mean, I think mm, so. That I guess there's like there's film influences and there's people doing other weird stuff kind of influences. So I'll talk first about people doing other weird stuff, not about the formal qualities of the the film necessarily. So of course, you know, there's a huge amount of actual um, artists from China, whatever that means, you know, um, dealing with um, broadly speaking technology and kind of creative practice like Miao Ying, Lu Yang, who I, I think both of whom I mentioned in that, as well as, you know, uh, like artists of a slightly older generation like Chao Fei, who's de dealing with um, sociological and technological issues. You know, one of her projects, which was a long time ago, this really surreal adaptation of um, a, you know, a very idiosyncratic second life world, which was, um, I think it's called RMB, yeah, RMB City, which is an amazing work as well as, you know, like Lu Yang's kind of delirious tributes to weird manga, but with a very kind of, um, uh, how should I say, sarcastic and funny edge, essentially, with, you know, huge, huge inspirations. Um, and Miao Ying are kind of dealing with internet culture in some aspects and RGO as well. But I think one thing I would say, and so that's, I guess, like artists using technology, um, but that I observed, you know, there's a certain lineage of that, but there's also obviously Chinese filmmakers who I don't know 
partly it's because of the way um, arts education exists in an academic setting. You know, there's film education and arts education, and those two schools, in my opinion, diverge quite a lot. So in terms of filmmakers, um, the generations are a very different thing. And it, to me, it seems that, you know, the filmmakers like Jia Zhang Ke and stuff like this deal with more, how should I say, um, this is a huge generalization, but kind of documenting life in uh, how things evolve throughout the 90s and 2000s in China through this kind of like meta, you know, fil fictional films that could just as easily look like um, documentaries to some extent. So there, you know, there was, to me, the, the kind of texture of their work was quite, quite different, but um, I felt very kind of, I guess, drawn to them, but also conscious that for me, diaspora person, it's not like my kind of context is, is quite different from that. It's much more, um, it's more, much more about a, uh, synthesis or kind of collage of like places, influences and, and, and so on, that it's incredibly like um, impure essentially. And I kind of wanted to stay true to that. Um, so yeah, those were a bunch of influences. Um, since we're on that topic, I was just wondering if you uh, could uh, share a few thoughts about sort of how uh, perhaps there's this kind of prevailing obs obsession with, you know, uh, the so-called life in China and you know, this kind of post-cultural revolution uh, kind of um, um, idea of how, um, how, how uh, the, the let's say the, the idea of Chinese living uh, in a way and how the histories kind of play into uh, this uh, image of um, the so-called Chinese uh, in uh, nowadays. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think it's very tricky because, you know, essentially you're talking about grand narratives, right? Talking about grand narratives or, you know, now, the Xi Jinping's policy of China dream, the Chinese dream. I don't know if that's a, you know, a mirror or a pastiche of um, the American, um, uh, you know, the, the American dream or this, you know, is there an equivalent, you know, is there a mirroring between like one belt, one road policy and like manifest destiny or something like that? Um, I think it's very difficult to make um, grand narratives, I think. Um, sorry, let me correct that. It's very easy to make grand narratives. It's very hard to make, um, uh, make them breathe, I think. And that's incredibly, uh, incredibly difficult because, you know, in, I guess in the case of China, the other thing I would say that the irony is that in my experience, in my opinion, um, the, Chinese are like the biggest Orientalists of all. Like, what do I mean by that? It's because preservation of the culture is absolutely central to, you know, what a culture is, whether that's propagated through so-called values. And I think the seven chapters are this really screwed up idea of values. Like copying is not a value, but in sign of futurism, it could be, you know, studying, working hard. Yeah, those are values. So they're kind of like 50-50 good values and 50-50 bad values. Gambling and addiction, bad values, but something I can really identify with, right? Copying, questionable value, but sometimes maybe economically it's justifiable. Studying, hard work, you can always count on those, so they're good. So unlike this idea of having only good values, it's like thinking about like how can the bad values be good as well? Or at least how can the bad values be incorporated and kind of made relevant? So in relation to this question, like what's this obsession with, you know, um, the, the culture, I think it's very hard to address because uh, sometimes people like focusing on the bad values, you know, because like in films, sometimes the evil characters are more interesting than the you know, than the heroes or heroines. So I think it's kind of similar. Um, people like fantasizing about an alternative uh, 
always, you know, no matter where you're from. So I think that that doesn't change. We have a question from uh, Clement. Um, the question is, since the uh, video essay is about creating a diasporic experience of the removal of the self, is there a place of individual failure and how do you deal with it? Um, I'm gonna interpret that question. So, um, Okay, so I mean, I'm gonna interpret that question as how do I interpret, um, okay, so if I'll just interpret that as like, what are the short, having made this four years ago, what do I see as like the shortcomings of what I tried to make and how has it evolved? Um, and Clement, if you wanna uh, correct that, just, type in a kind of amendment to that. So I guess having made this in August, 2016, it's like nearly four years ago. Um, I think, I think one observation I've made is that the, the problem with making a kind of grand narrative and obviously calling something sign of futurism makes it sound like it's a grand narrative is that it, things, I guess, ideas, um, complex ideas get oversimplified very quickly. So something that might actually not necessarily be about, you know, um, technology, but it's more about culture, like gets uh, equated with a, you know, um, techno or sorry, techno orientalism, essentially. Um, the thing I didn't really anticipate as well is because um, unlike a lot of my work as well, um, it's, you know, Sinofuturism, I kind of got the ingredients from YouTube, so it exists on the internet, internet. And of course, when something does exist like that, it has, you have no filter, which is, which is fine. It's great. It's like how I um, read and absorb lots of artworks that I'm interested in. But it makes me think, how can you know, to what extent is a frame necessary, for example, because the kind of, in my experience, the people or response who I've got, um, who I've got from this particular work have varied quite dramatically, you know, from people interested, like, academically in the subject to, uh, you know, young mainland Chinese people or diaspora people or like people, or, you know, sizes and shapes and colors, basically. But the issue is that a lot of people see China in very simplistic terms, probably including myself. So I think the individual failure would be to go into further depth with the work, but I kind of wanted to make something mm, that was as much about like emotion and affect as about, I guess, historical truth or relevance and that's why i was talking about it as a conspiracy theory um so this is yeah just i guess reflections on on your question um because sorry and also to address the since the video essay is about creating a diasporic experience of the removal of the self um i think i i think maybe how i talk about the work I do sometimes seems like that, but I don't think the video essay itself is necessarily about that. Um, but it actually comes from a lot of the observation that often this kind of cultural studies and history stuff is made by diasporic communities. Edward Said, for example, you know, um, it's not, um, what is it? It's not so much about where you are, but I guess where you're, mind dwells, I guess, or where you feel that, that you are, rather. Like, um, I think, an, you know, another, for example, you know, Franz Fanon, as well as someone who spent most of their time not in the place where they are writing about or where they are necessarily from. But I think that's also in the nature of this kind of knowledge transmission to uh, 
uh, where the community or the author actually divorces themselves from being tied to a place because you know that's part of the uh, political statement that I guess is being made. So both the diaspora, both sorry, diaspora or exile, depending on what what you know what term is used, are quite closely related, um, and it depends on how far the author wants to make a statement about about those things. And sometimes it's not the author who does it, it's people interpreting the work and imposing a certain um, classification onto the work or author, I think. Um, thank you, uh, Lawrence. And, um, <laughs> Hope that answers it. <laughs> and uh, Clement, well, Clement, feel free to uh, uh, kind of elaborate uh, if you like. Um, and. Um, I do have another question from Matthew uh, uh, previously. Um, so uh, Matthew said, when watching the section on study and the intense competition and pressure uh, that students are put within their schooling, I couldn't help but be reminded of the sobering and uh, mental, um, melancholic film Battle uh, Royal from 2000, um, symbolizing Japan's cruelly competitive schooling resulting over 2000 student suicides per year um, back in 2000. I had the feeling of this competition at end quotes, uh, work till you drop, uh, unquote, attitude uh, throughout the film, including the societal uh, um, eleganness to um, gaming, gambling, and even labor as ways of living. Uh, could you speak more on your thoughts regarding the idea of competition within that society that normalizes an intense uh, delegation living under pressures? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess, like I was saying before, this idea of like studying and labor as good, dependable, good values and practices, right? Um, interesting for sure, and it's very deeply ingrained even in my own mentality. So, but sorry, but also something that's literally di directly relevant to deep learning, right? Because the idea for deep learning is to, in theory, create the perfect, the perfect student, right? Like I said earlier with Alan Turing and his theory about AI being like a child mind, essentially deep learning research is creating the perfect student. Um, and how it relates to the idea of competition is because, again, this is not a cultural studies lecture, but you know, the um, modern system of schooling as you know, Foucault and whatever reminds us very well, the modern system of schooling and discipline emerged at, in, in Western schooling, let's say, emerged at the same time as the factory production system, which, you know, um, required once the parents are put in industrialized labor and in the factory and not in the field, um, and once they move away from the grandparents' generation, they need the children to go somewhere. So, you know, it's no mistake that school times and work times are closely aligned in, in that sense. And the and so it's also no surprise that the competition that is um, embedded within the capitalist workforce, I'm talking about Western society here, um, finds its analog in the competition embedded within the educational school system. Um, so because, you know, they are one, one and the same, essentially. Um, in the case of Sinofuturism, even, even for me, it was quite it was really surprising that, you know, one of the teachers in one of the doc documentary snippets was like, um, yeah, there was no schooling during, <laughs> for three years at one point during the Cultural Rev Revolution and no exams for 10, right? So um, this policy-driven uh, evacuation of school examination competition, which is obviously in line with a com communist ethos, right? Not, not just um, equality on like no individual ownership of property, but also no competition amongst those who could, might be elite is obviously a strongly ideological thing. So, you know, and also the ones already, you know, in the um, positions of power or control 
no longer have threats from below because you know there is no mechanism for people to rise. Um, in in the Chinese context, of course, the situation is very deeply ingrained. So the scene with the wax figure museums references the you know um, the kind of I guess the spiritual precursor to exams like the high school leaving Gaokao examinations, which was the um, Imperial Mandarin examinations where I think every year they would have countrywide exams in which the top students, oh, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the top students would essentially get official um, positions in the government bureaucracy, which is the equivalent of like making it in a kind of um, in that Confucian imperial society. So this competition is very deeply ingrained. Um, beyond that, like, I mean, it's, I, it's a mistake to say that it's part of human nature, but another thing that comes to mind is uh, not just this like Foucauldian analysis of how um, school systems and industrialized labor are intertwined, but also the way in which uh, Dar Darwinian competition has been, you know, this scientific theory of survival of the fittest and so on, has been used to justify the continuation of uh, entrenched power relationships, you know, like survival of the fittest, the, you know, the, the best and brightest rules, therefore that's the way it should be. So it's obviously deeply problematic because the the game of competition is um uh let's say biased i mean some people are set up to win more than others let's say thank you um oh uh we have uh some other questions here uh there is one question from uh julia uh thanks so much very vague question i thought the video raises questions about the relationship of AI and futurism to politics, especially fascism and uh, capitalism. Um, I, yes. <laughs> I, I kind of felt that we sort of touch upon some of those uh, earlier, uh, but uh, Lawrence, if you have any uh, additional thoughts, feel free to uh, share them. Uh, yes, I guess that's the subject of of the film i don't i mean it's so vague that there's almost no question there one interesting thing i always find um like word origins etymology really interesting so i think um paradox of fascism right is that fascism is from a latin word meaning like a bundle of sticks right so it's this idea that Fasces is like the bundle of sticks that is stronger. You can break one individually, but together you can't break them. So it's this weird idea that I don't know how the rationalization that um, unity and um, unity and uh, loss of individual will go together somehow. You know, like earlier we we're talking about collectivism, uh, this collective versus ind individual mindset but um as i think the only thing is i think obviously sinofuturism does not align with a fascist view viewpoint but uh in terms of word origins there's not this fascism is very close to an idea of like um community solidarity but I think it also demonstrates how easily it's kind of perverted and and uh, misappropri and you know misappropriated in the wrong way, essentially. Oh, oh wait, Spe Julia has followed up. Specific and yeah. Um, uh, just to read it uh, out loud. Um, mm. <laughs> recording for the purpose of. Um, uh, uh, so uh, Julia followed up with, um, I thought specifically the references to Italian futurism, accelerationism, accelerationism. Also, the also that Sino-futurism has no interest except for survival and self-replication. Mm -hmm. Weakness. 
Yeah, um, again, sorry, that's not really a question, but yes, it is re referring, of course, to Italian fut uh, futurism and uh, accelerationism. Um, I think the idea of, so sign of futurism has no in interest except for survival and self-replication. So this was, I guess, the idea that Sinofuturism is more like a like an organism or a life form. So, in if you have a conspiracy theory, you also have the equivalent is like a virus, or you know how an idea goes viral. That it's not necessarily about correct morality, like good ha having good habits versus bad habits, but it's about the kind of spread or growth of the particular culture, um, rather than having like a value judgment attached to what is the right culture. So that was, I guess, a reflection on the idea of, you say, you know, if liberal humanism says that that's the best way to be, that's obviously like, um, I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a pretty fascist point of view in a sense. I mean, and, and you know, of course, we, it's very debatable what, um, to what extent, you know, freedom exists in that context. And of course, Italian uh, futurism had very, you know, I guess, very specific political views, shall we say, um, that don't just um, uh, fantasize about technology, but also the kind of power and authority of that technology as well, which has, you know, has definitely um, evolved, I think. Um... Thank you so much for questions. We just have one more and uh, we're hoping to wrap up in a bit. So if you have any other questions, feel free to send them in. Uh, there was a question from Sasha. Uh, did your work with found footage influence your future relationship with CGI? Yeah, sure. So um, definitely, I think one thing is because CGI it, um, and computer generated animation is an incredibly laborious process, um, just like any form of animation, because, I mean, essentially you have to build the world, which gives like a huge amount of um, control over it. But what you gain, and in my experience, what you gain from control of the world, you lose at a later stage because you don't want to waste anything that you've already done because you've already invested a huge amount of time in making it. I mean, it's similar, you know, if you write an essay, you can't, it's very difficult to cut things out. It's very difficult to throw away old artworks and so on, because you value, um, you know, you're biased, forget what the bias is called, but you know, you're biased towards those things that you've invested a lot of your time doing. So using found footage, you don't, I don't care if Wong Kar Wai took two million dollars in five years to make the CGI beautiful opening scene of 2060, uh, 2046. I'm just ripping it off a DVD and I will cut and trim it however I like. So it gives a lot of um, freedom with montage, but you get less about place essentially. Of course, for Sign of Futures, it wasn't really about place. It was about a kind of non-place essentially. So it made sense that um, the found footage or this was used in that way or essentially my place was YouTube you know uh, there's a lot obviously been being written and has been written that theorize about the topography or spatiality of the internet whether it's its physical infrastructure or how navigating online or the back end of technologies creates a new kind of uh, geography um, but the the difficult thing as well is that it's so open you know it, it's an archive you know in theory it's like an archive with everything kind of like a Borges story library of Babel kind of thing so there's the difficulty with found footage is an overabundance of it that makes it difficult to potentially difficult to compose um, because you have so much stuff whereas with CGI it's actually the opposite where you like I find with my CGI films, it's like, I always wish like, oh, I should have made this clip like five seconds longer. With found footage, it doesn't matter. But when it's really labor in intensive, you 
think about time differently, I guess. Yeah. So different elements of the filmmaking process get highlighted in one rather than the other. Um, we have, um, thank you, Lawrence. And um, I like how the questions just start coming in uh, at this point of the, the chat. Uh, thank you uh, for engaging. So we have a question from M. Oh, mysterious. I viewed uh, Sinofuturism as more of a speculative um, a fiction um, bracket future forming than a conspiracy theory. Of course, there may be a point of uh, communion between the two. I was, wonder I was wondering what makes you label it as a former. Um, is it due to its references of visual and cultural uh, to the present and the past as a way of pointing towards a probable future? Yeah, no, no, of course, these two things are very closely interlinked. I think, um, I think it's again to do with terminology, right? So if Sino, mm, I mean, I guess the closest analog would be how acceleration is considered as the intersection of, let's say, speculative fiction and philosophy, let's say. Um, for me, because Sinofuturism being an ism in Chinese, to eat, it's like it's an ideology, right? And so to me, if something's an ideology, it operates more as, um, as a theory than a fiction. Of course, there's a huge amount of fiction in any kind of theory or ideology. But what I mean by that is by calling it, you know, Sinofuturism, fascism, um, like, you know, capitalism, Marxism, to me, those political philosophies, yes, of course, they're speculative fictions, but in a playful way, I like thinking more of them more as conspiracy theories, right? So in a sense, like, whatever, if you say, like, Marxist Das Kapital is an incredibly erudite conspiracy theory about the need to change the future, of course, I, I don't know whether he would say it's speculative fiction because he invents a million other terms to um, justify his mode of thought. But the video essay Sign of Futurism, initially I thought of it more as a ideological conspiracy theory. In after that, I used it more as a speculative fiction in the way that it became wrapped up in my other work uh, like Geomancer and, and Idol basically. But yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's it's a fine line between speculative fiction and conspiracy theory. One more thing I would say is Margaret Atwood, in her opinion, calls speculative fiction that which could plausibly happen in the future, right? Which often draws from uh, events that have happened in history and kind of transmuted and transposed in the future. So that to to her, that's um speculative fiction. So in that sense, you know, this like past and future kind of thing, yeah, of course it operates as uh, speculative fiction, again, 1839 to 2046. I think the difference with the year 2046, again, being back to this, uh, the, rever the full reversion of Hong Kong back to the mainland Chinese system of governance, the difference, I guess, is that it's not speculative in the same way because it's an expiry date right so usually a kind of whatever science fiction film set in the future it's like a speculation because maybe life will be like that in the year 2035 or whatever but the difference with 2046 is that the date will come if the world doesn't end but the date will come and you know that that is inevitable or presumably that date is inevitable so it's like a future that you know um, will arrive at a specific time which is very different from the kind of speculative fiction that's like the emerging climate cli crisis for example because or you know the spread of coronavirus because those are projections on the future that maybe it might be like this maybe it won't maybe the world's temperatures will rise by five degrees by 2100 or maybe they won't so that's 
to me, that's more speculation. Whereas 2046, it's like, that will, you know, that's in, you know, not you know, 25, 26 years time. Um, so it, to me, it operates slightly differently, I guess, emotionally as well. You know, it's like when you're on school holidays and you know you've got one week left, you, you feel different than at the beginning when you know you have three months. So this idea of the end coming, not in an apocalyptic sense, but just operates, mm, uh, I, th I think just operates on a different part of the psyche. So I was, I guess, when making Sinofuturism, I was more interested on that false ideology rather than speculative fiction, because I knew six months later, I'd be making a speculative fiction, which was the CGI film. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to close this up with just one question that I really, I try really hard <laughs> of, um, to avoid uh, at the beginning. Uh, basically, um, you know, uh, because the film was made uh, in 2016, and of course there are some, I guess, perhaps some new developments or um, uh, a new thinking that kind of uh, would, would um, in a way, would enrich the uh, what, what you have um, composed before. And of course, we're all living through a pandemic. Um, so, um, and since we were talking about the future here, and I was wondering um, uh, if there's any sort of revelations, um, uh, um, revelations, do I say that? Uh, revelations or any kind of observations that you have in mind that are changing the course of these um, uh, uh, yeah. topic? I guess, yeah, I mean, another, another great, huge question. Um, I think the idea, I, I'll just talk about the idea of an idea, I suppose. I think is that What's interesting, I mean, besides all the horrible hu human problems um, of today is the difference between like a virus and a life form, right? Because biologically, a virus is not considered life because it does not have the means to uh, replicate itself without a host organism. But at the same time, um, it is, very tricky because it's as close to it you know it's it's code biological code but it's not quite life it's this like liminal space between something alive and something dead um you know uh, other like accelerationist writers get very interested in this idea not just of virality you know this idea that an idea spreads you could say it's you know, and as a metaphor, you could say the idea is viral or the idea is really alive. Um, I think what's been, I guess, interesting for me is, I think, as you know, people have probably seen, there's a lot of a uh, desire to like make sense of things, whether that's computationally through modeling, prediction, AI, and big data, and um, uh, and those forms, you know, like trust the science, this idea that science will deliver the answers, right? And so every government has the, the scientific panel of advisors, but we can't, we don't know whether, as a citizen, you don't know whether you can trust the advisors because you don't know if you can trust the policy because you don't know if you can trust the data because everything is very, very political and ideological. I think one paradox well, one thing that's very interesting for me is that uh, obviously how um, uh, surveillance uh, has been treated, not just trust in government, but, you know, um, testing for the virus, monitoring and so on. Um, and it, it does surprise me very much how biased the media is in representing uh, different testing regimes in China, South Korea and Singapore, for example than in the, uh, shall we say, wealthiest countries in the world, which have different policies towards testing, because also the very different policies towards privacy and, um, you know, like private freedoms, essentially. But the irony is that the, the, 
sometimes the places, I mean, I'm not even just talking about statistics, but how lives are valued, actual lives, not viral lives, is, has a, how should I say, it seems strange that how actual human lives are valued has a reverse correlation with places that might claim to have the highest amount of democratic freedom, which is a very strange paradox, essentially, um, to have. Um, not just, I mean, I'm not even just talking about uh, America and, and the UK where I am, but also um, Scandinavia and uh, places like that. Of course, surveillance is a hugely, is a complete, another huge subject that I won't go into. But it, again, it just, it's just a hugely paradoxical situation where like, you know, uh, it's a hugely paradoxical situation and it's quite unprecedented also because of the reliance on data, which is itself untrustworthy. And it's, it's just really strange. <laughs> That's all. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for this, um, for all your thoughts and then uh, for presenting this film to us because I do th think that it's, um, uh, it, it kind of brings together a lot of the ideas that might, um, that sort of, in a way, I would say intercontextualize themselves uh, and um, pointing to something that's um, pretty close, but also um, to us, but also kind of uh, um, leaning back towards uh, where we are. Um, so I think that's sort of all the questions uh, that, uh, that I and the, uh, the, uh, everyone uh, sort of have. And I would like to thank Lawrence, of course, uh, for uh, being here with um, us because it's like, what time? Like one. It's like <laughs> one. Yeah. I'm a uh, night, night person, it's fine. Actually, me too. I, I never sleep until three. Um, anyway, sorry. And um, uh, I would like to thank the, uh, the Visual Arts Center of Carrington and Dion and Matthew uh, for presenting this talk. And then it's a great pleasure to have everyone here. And I would like to pass the mic back to Dion. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Lawrence. That was so insightful, so interesting. Um, and again, Henry, thank you so much and Center A for partnering with us on this. I do apologize, Matthew couldn't be here tonight to uh, you know, put, put some of his insight into this. I know he had prepared some uh, intriguing questions. I think some of them were shared, um, but his voice was definitely missing tonight. But I, I just want to thank you for taking the time for, for bringing this to our community and, and for exposing us to your work. And I know we have recorded this, so we will make it available after, uh, you know, especially the discussion part, there's a lot to, to digest in there. Um, and I think it's definitely worth a second watch. Um, so on that note, I will uh, bid everyone a good evening and thank everyone for joining us and taking the time uh, to spend with Lawrence Center A and the VAC. Amazing. No, thanks. Thanks so much. Also follow uh, Lawrence's work at lawrencelec.com and also when you're posting on social media, make sure to use hashtag Lawrence Leck. For sure. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks so much for joining.